this terrifying thing. Giving me the wide circle, hoping I stop paying attention for sure. I think she'd go eat some rabbits is what I should do. Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples. I'm, you know, I can't complain so much today. It's not a bad morning. It's probably in the low 60s if I had to guess. Uh, I actually do have a little light jacket on uh, along with shorts and uh, whatever else, but uh, it's, not, it's not horrible. I'm not dripping. The glasses aren't fogged up. There's a little bit of condensation on the car, but it's not that bad. So all in all, it's a decent morning, and uh, thank you, you know, about friggin' time. I have absolutely no confidence that it's going to last uh, at all. I imagine it's going to be miserable again here in a few days, and things will get right back to normal. Uh, we have Sebring this weekend. It's Turkey Trot. It's one of the bigger races of the year. Uh, the nice part about it for me, other than the racing and the weekend in Sebring, which is honestly as full of debauchery as a weekend in Sebring can be. It's much better when you go to Daytona because there's really foul things you can get up to there. But uh, uh, you get to leave on Thanksgiving. So you can abandon your family right in the middle of dinner, which is terrific. You can do like an eat and run. Uh, you don't have to sit there and put up with all the crap that comes after dinner. And, uh, you know, there's none of that oh, I love hanging around my family shit that everyone, well, I guess some people pretend, maybe most, but uh, others uh, are jealous that I'm getting the hell out of there, and I am, and that's great. Uh, there was a near cat attack this morning. I'm not going to lie and say he came at me or anything, because he didn't. Uh, he actually kept his distance, but he made me nervous, and I wasn't really sure what he was up to, and I'm definitely going to keep an eye out and uh, make sure he's not hanging around while I'm distracted. You just never know with Peter's cats. In fact, there's all this commotion here in the driveway, this, you know, flex of turf flung up and uh, debris and that sort of thing. And I'm pretty sure that's because his cat ate a toddler. I'm not positive. I don't see, like, the remains of a toddler or anything. But, uh, you know, the cat's not going to waste any of that. It's probably going to drag it off into the woods somewhere and hide it so it can have a few meals out of it. Uh, but definitely something very unpleasant went down right here. And uh, I'm glad I wasn't here for it. Uh, but anyway, look, let's just get into this car. We're going to dive directly, leap into it. And, uh, you know, I had that uh, ninth gen Thunderbird the other day. And uh, as a result, I thought this would be a good video to follow it up on. This is a seventh generation Cougar, uh, the first of them, actually, a 1989 model, uh, a Mercury Cougar LS. And uh, all in all, yeah, you know, I'd say it's a fairly interesting car, but it's not. I mean, I, you know, it's probably interesting to guys like me who uh, grew up with them. You know, they, I mean, this was a key car of my youth, uh, and not in any way that I, like, wanted one or lusted after it. But, you know, when I'm 17, 18, 19, I graduated high school this year. I, I knew every car that was being made. I knew who drove what. There were people who had them, and uh, it was just the kind of thing you kept track of then. So uh, I was well aware of Cougars and uh, what they were up to, and uh, it's interesting for me as a result to have this now. Uh, but either way, it's the seventh gen. <clears throat> it shares... Uh, platform with the, uh, what was a new platform at the time, with the 10th generation uh, Thunderbird, uh, which it had shared platforms with for a long, long time since moving over from the uh, Mustang in the earliest days. If you remember the early uh, Cougar, the first Cougar was Mustang-based. It was a pony car, and it was beautiful. And in direct defiance of my... <laughs> My whatever you want to call it, the way I talk. It was, uh, it was actually intended to look European. So, uh, you know, obviously American companies were hearkening to Euro cars long before I say they were. But um, uh, what I would argue is that they began in earnest, you know, uh, with these cars and with the prior generation before this. So, uh, but anyway, there it is. The Cougar name factored very, very heavily into the Mercury marketing setup. Uh, they had sign of the cat 
written on their dealerships. They had giant stuffed cats on the roof of their dealerships. And, uh, you know, who could forget the sultry join the cat set ads done by the likes of Cheryl Teagues and Farrah Fawcett's in the, you know, the 70s and all that uh, sexy disco stuff uh, where they walked around in slinky dresses in evening time talking about their cougars and, you know, waiting for some Burt Reynolds looking dude to come and sweep them away. So uh, what's interesting is by the time this car rolled around, not, not in 89, but a few years later, uh, a rather matronly Kate Jackson, who was a co-star of Farrah Fawcett and Charlie's Angels, uh, now many years later, was the spokeslady for uh, the Cougar, which, you know, to me is a sign of the changing demographics and how the, you know, the cat set had become the cat ladies. And uh, probably that's a large portion of who owned these cars, certainly by the time the late 90s rolled around. Uh, despite its very questionable looks, the Cougar just prior to this one, the, um, the 6th gen, had been a, tr a pretty good sales success. Uh, I thought it was really butt ugly, but a lot of people apparently liked it. And um, as a result, they styled this car after that one, like as an evolution of that one. Uh, the main cue on the whole car is, of course, that notchback rear, that sort of almost straight up and down rear window. That was the biggest thing that was retained from that. And to me, you know, back then I didn't like it. I do now. Uh, but uh, they did get rid of these sort of upswept quarter windows in the back that that generation had, which I didn't like and still don't like today. And uh, one can argue that, you know, was a, st eh, who knows, it may be people like, I didn't. And uh, I think Ford agreed because they got rid of it on this one. Uh, but the new platform they came out with was called the MN12. And in some ways it paralleled that GM10 platform from, uh, from General Motors. And you know, Ford put a lot of friggin' money into it, to the tune of $2 billion back then. I mean, that's a shocking amount of money, more than Lexus spent developing their LS anyway. And, uh, you know, they built a pretty cool car as a result of it. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that that investment paid off because it came out like right at the onset of all the SUV insanity that took off and uh, the large coupe segment was steadily declining. So, you know, like the GM10, I think it was sort of a misplaced priority for Ford that didn't work out. Uh, and in fact, in later years of this Cougar, you get into like the 96, 97, uh, they got decontented. Uh, things like courtesy lights and glove box lights and underhood lights got removed. And that's not the kind of thing you do to a successful lineup. Uh, in fact, it's one of the things Cadillac did to the Elante uh, to try and help make that thing less of a uh, loss as it went on. And uh, it just shows you, I think, that people stopped buying it. It also panned out in terms of production numbers because except for one year, uh, the prior gen Cougar sold over 100,000 units every time, and uh, this one never once broke that barrier. And in fact, in the later years, was under 50,000. So, uh, you know, I just think it didn't work out for them at the end of the day. And on top of the SUVs, you also had like Acura, Infiniti, Lexus. They started to build some midsize cars, which were competing with this. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, the GM10 cars, the Cutlass, uh, the uh, Grand Prix and uh, with the Regal, uh, they also came in and competed with this. So basically what you had was a very crowded market for a dwindling customer base, and uh, that never spells big profits for for a car company. And even, uh, you know, cars like Honda Accords, the uh, Honda Accord Coupe was becoming more expensive and luxurious then. So it was pretty crowded territory that uh, Mercury was... Uh, was wading into, and uh, it's kind of a shame because Ford really poured their heart and soul into this uh, MN12 thing. Uh, they targeted, not in terms of direct competition, but in terms of road handling and manners, that sort of thing. Uh, they wanted to handle on par with like the Mercedes 560 SEC and uh, the BMW 6 Series. And they made the wheelbase and the dimensions. And uh, it actually had a longer wheelbase, this car, than the 560 SEC. And it retained its rear wheel drive setup, which was pretty cool at the time. So, you know, pretty lofty goals for Mercury that I think, frankly, didn't get. You know, they just didn't pan out. Uh, in pursuit of that goal, though, they gave this thing a, 
uh, four-wheel independent suspension, uh, which is pretty epic. I mean, other than the Corvette and, you know, like a couple of oddballs from the past, if you remember my cousin Vinny, the, the Pontiac Tempest with its <laughs> independent rear. But other than that, this was the first mass-produced, you know, big GM Ford Chrysler rear-wheel drive coupe that had four-wheel independent suspension. And uh, that's pretty neat stuff. And uh, it's just a shame. It, they really, you know, kudos to them. They, they did the right thing. Uh, but um, it only ever made its way under the Thunderbird, uh, the Cougar, and then there was a variant that was the Lincoln Mark 8. And I can't believe that Ford poured $2 billion into the project uh, to make three cars. I just, uh, I think that they had planned for it to go on to be underpinning some other stuff, and it just didn't go down that way because of the whole SUV thing. Uh, but uh, anyway, it went on from 89 all the way through 97. Uh, it disappeared for a year and then came back as sort of a weird, smaller global Ford product uh, that they put a Cougar badge on. And uh, I don't know if that thing sold well or not. Probably not, because you just don't see any of them now. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting thing and was uh, a hatchback from Mercury, which they hadn't done since the Capri uh, many, many years past. Uh, but let's get back to 1989 for a moment, the year this thing came out. And uh, frankly, it was a good year for me. I mean, I, you know, I had graduated from high school. I was a young, idiot, stupid, reckless kid seeking out forbidden joys and, you know, finding <laughs> trouble of some sort. And it just, you know, it was great times. It honestly was. I mean, there's no question I was a total idiot. Uh, but uh, that said, I really did enjoy the hell out of it. Um, I covered the year in depth in that we did an 89 560 SL Mercedes a few weeks ago. And I covered the year in depth on that one. So I'm not going to get too far into it here. But a quick roll through of the big news events of 1989. Uh, you had the end of the Cold War. Uh, you had George Bush meeting Gorbachev and, you know, writing it off and putting an end to 60 years, 50 years of misery, maybe less, I don't know, whatever. Basically, it ended and the, the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, you had the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which uh, you remember the guy in front of the tank, uh, really famous, iconic image. You're probably not allowed to say that or mention it anymore, which um, honestly gives me the creeps. I mean, is anyone also creeped out that you can't talk about China in any sort of negative way, even if you're a person in this country, you see it all the time. And I have to say it does <clears throat> trouble me. So in fact, if this is the last video I do, <laughs> you have an idea what happened. Uh, you also had the Exxon Valdez. Uh, you had Ted Bundy riding the lightning in Florida, you know, good old Florida. Uh, you had uh, the Velvet Revolution. You had Salman Rushdie and Leona Helmsley. So you know, a little bit of stuff going on in 89, but nothing too fantastic. I guess the Cold War was a big deal. Uh, there were also lots of original movies from 89. I'm not going to mention all of them because there were a lot of, you know, sequels that came out, which to me is just, even if they're good, they're not worth mentioning. And, uh, you know, but the original Batman, that's hardly original, but I guess it was, you know, they, every movie wasn't a superhero movie then. So Batman actually kind of was interesting. Uh, you had Twins, you had Driving Miss Daisy. Uh, you had Dead Poet Society, and you had My Left Foot uh, with that Irish guy. So, you know, some pretty interesting movies at the time. But uh, let's get back into this cougar. And again, maybe we're going to get an actual proper short video. I don't want short, short videos. I just don't want them to be 50 minutes long. It gets to be too damn much. Uh, there were two trim levels. And here, this is opportune. I'm at the back of the car. Uh, you see this is the Cougar LS, which, you know, taken to Norway, probably stands for luxury sport. Who knows? Uh, but um, that's what it was. And the other option was the Cougar XR7, uh, which they did go to great lengths to differ differentiate that. Uh, you know, for any sort of conveniences and luxury versus sport and and youth. Uh, you know, the, the XR7 had four-wheel discs with standard ABS. It had uh, an electronically adjustable suspension. Uh, you had digital uh, gauges in the LS. You had analog in the uh, XR7, which is kind of interesting because that's a total flip-flop of what was going on 10 years before. Uh, I mean, you remember the 84 Corvette came out and it 
had all these fancy Knight Rider gauges. You, uh, the 300 ZX had the fancy Knight Rider gauges. The sportier versions of those cars were all digital. Uh, well, I guess that it made up a cry from real traditional sports car guys who wanted the analog stuff. So uh, by the time 89 rolled around, it was much more hip to put the needles uh, and numbers in the uh, sporty cars. And uh, the racy people who bought LS models, you know, who sort of pictured themselves as being racy, they wanted the electronic instrumentation. So a big flip-flop there. But uh, the LS was definitely more elegant. It used more chrome. It was all monochrome on the uh, on the XR7. Uh, it used more elegant wheels. This thing probably came with white walls. I, I would bet it did. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe not. But um, uh, definitely they went for a more luxurious thing. And the Europeanization, if that's a word, uh, was really in full swing there. You see those Euro headlight type things, the little grill, the rounded edges, the minimal use of chrome. It's there, but it's minimized. Uh, there's no rocker panel trim. The mirrors are blacked out. The door handles are blacked out. They're almost flush. Uh, the glass is flush. Uh, definitely, by this point in time, Ford was going hardcore uh, into their uh, Euro weenie motions and making the cars look uh, more like a global product. So, gone are the big ornate shit of the 70s, and, you know, in is the more conservative look of European cars. Uh, even the wheelbase, the way it's stretched out, uh, led to much smaller overhangs than you're used to on American cars. They really did stretch the wheels out, which made the interior bigger. And they pushed the uh, wheels and tires out to the edge instead of having, uh, you know, all sorts of air and room inside the wheel walls like they did in some of the earlier models. I mean, you look at 70s Cougars and you know, the wheels and tires are a foot inside from the wheel wells. It's just interesting the way this goes on. So uh, I tell you what, I'm going to take a minute to get my shit together. And uh, then we're going to delve directly into this car. All right, so let's dive into this thing. One thing that's kind of weird is when I parked here this morning, uh, all of a sudden I've got ashes all over the car, which is really weird. You see all these little white flecks on it. Don't know where the hell they're coming from. Uh, and I'll tell you this much. When you're at an Austrian's house and there's ashes on your car, you pay attention, you know? You keep your eyes out and see what's going on. But, uh, eh, who knows? Who knows what Peter's up to in his spare time. Uh, Ford's still using the two-key system on this car. Haven't looked in the trunk yet on this thing myself, so this is going to be a surprise for both of us. All right, and it's good. I don't see any issues there. So uh, they've moved the spare tire from the front uh, to a uh, compartment under here, I presume. So I'm a little afraid to open this. Who knows what Dalton did? Eh, he's fine. So you got a donut now, and it's buried under the floor uh, with a little protective thing over it, uh, which is actually quite nice in the sense of it gives you much more trunk space. So uh, I have to say it's got a rather low... Uh, threshold to cross. The uh, trunk has uh, most of the uh, taillights in, uh, going up in the air, so uh, the loading should be pretty easy. And it's got a nice big trunk to work with, so yeah, no complaints there. Everything looking pretty good, and uh, you know, what can you say about it? It's a trunk. Have a look under the hood. I found this difficult to do when I was first looking at the car, so we'll see if that's still the case. Oh God, it seems to be. It's got a slide of some kind, which isn't all together. Oh, there we go. Okay, so under here we've got the uh, 3.8 liter Essex V6. By this time in 89, it was now multi-port injected and had about 140 horsepower. So all in all, not terribly bad. Uh, in 89, in fact, this was the only engine you could get. Was the uh, Well, the XR7 had a supercharged version putting out 210. Uh, which, I mean, man, think about that for a minute. Which It shared that with the Thunderbird Super Coupe at the time. And uh, you could also get it with a five-speed manual gearbox. So here's Ford in 89 building a, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to almost call it a full-size coupe. It's technically intermediate. It's mid-size, but it's a big sucker. Look how wide it is. You know, it's a nice big wide car. 
and uh, you could get a supercharged engine, a five-speed manual gearbox, four-wheel discs, and uh, four-wheel independent suspension. So uh, definitely a pretty racy setup for the time, and frankly, I didn't give it enough credit back then. Uh, only now, looking back, do I think, wow, those are pretty good stats for this car. Uh, but uh, in this, the LS model, uh, you got the, um, the 140 horsepower uh, naturally aspirated version. It got bumped up with that multi-port, which is good, and uh, it would be connected to a four-speed automatic overdrive trans, which, uh, you know, keeps the revs down on the interstate. So, uh, this is like a 32,000 mile car, a bit of a time machine like that Thunderbird, and uh, under the hood, yeah, just like it would have been way back then, and uh, everything looking good, nice and proper. So, I tell you what, I'm going to get the hood back down, I'm going to get my shit in the trunk, and then we're going to hop in, do the interior and go for a spin. One thing that I should have mentioned with the engine is because of this lower hood line, I mean the whole car is kind of lower, wider, and sleeker than the prior gen, they couldn't fit the 302 right out of the box. And uh, that's why this first year had uh, only the uh, six cylinder. Uh, later on, they redesigned the intake for that uh, 4.9 liter and they were able to fit it. And then that went on and became the 4.6. Uh, the only unfortunate thing is once the V8 got in it and became the XR7, uh, gone was the five speed manual, so. Yeah, there it is. All right, let's have a look inside. Uh, also interesting the way the uh, uh, door starts to go into the roof line. And uh, that, again, is also a little bit more Europeanized and made for a uh, better seal, more quiet. Uh, it came out on the prior gen cars. All right, so inside, inside, we've got this sort of 1980s stuff going on. But uh, again, getting more into the European look. Everything's becoming a little more muted. I mean, there's wood everywhere. There's no question about that. Uh, what's interesting about it is it's kind of a... Uh, a soft, it's um, a matte finish, which uh, has become much more popular today than it was back then. And I presume it was done to sort of undercut uh, the uh, the wood look in the car. But I think it actually looks quite nice. Uh, it has pretty good fit and finish on the door panels. Can't really complain. Nice little velour inserts, nice little velour seats, um, you know, with bunched up stuff. That might be a little bit of a harkening back to the 70s and probably meant to please the uh, traditional uh, cougar buyer. Uh, because it was wider, it became a real free across back seat. So uh, you're going to be able to chuck some Canadians back there with no issues. They're going to be fairly chipper. Uh, they actually have a center armrest if there's only two of them. They got shoulder belts and, you know, everything looking pretty good and proper back there. Uh, the bunched up velour does, and looks a little bit like a diaper. I mean, more than a uh, Spanish bordello, you know, but um, but it's fine and it's definitely fancy looking and uh, befitting the car. I imagine you could also get leather. Uh, this was car was supposed to be released with airbags, which uh, back in 89, uh, you know, the, again with the feds always moving things forward, uh, they had decreed that 89 models either had to have automatic seat belts uh, or um, or airbags. I think it was 80. Maybe they were jumping the gun by a year or something. But either way, uh, that was a thing. If you remember the Ferrari Testarossa at the time also had the quite a few cars had these. Uh, and what it meant was that it was a passive restraint. So when you got in and started up the car, the car would put on the seatbelt for you. Uh, these things are going to track all the way back and come down here. Uh, weirdly, you still had to put on the sh uh, the... Uh, the bottom belt, the uh, lap belt, and if you didn't, I can only imagine if you're in some kind of a head-on, uh, then your midsection's going to come in and crush your manhood in the steering wheel, so... Eh, I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of people disabled these because you can disconnect them. You can take that out of there. And uh, if you uh, run them all the way back and then pull the fuse, you can just sort of put the belts on almost the normal way, uh, although you're putting two on instead of one. But uh, either way, kind of interesting. And let's hop in this thing. All right, so we're going to fire it up. Here's <laughs> that digital instrumentation that I was talking about. Oh, God, here, ah, oh, God! The 
looking back, it almost decapitated me. Uh, you see now the seat belts are in the back position. Uh, but anyway, here's the stitch. I mean, and it, it, this was all the rage in the early 1980s. I mean, this was a big deal, uh, but I guess less so by 89. Uh, it was essentially standard equipment in this car. So this is the only cluster you could get with the LS. And uh, then you went into that um, XR7 and had the analog stuff. I like it. I mean, maybe I'm just a product of my time, but I, you know, it wowed me as a kid, all this sort of Knight Ridery Star Wars shit, and it still kind of wows me today. And I'm an absolute sucker for it, in much the same way I am pop up headlamps. I just really like it. Uh, you've got your uh, gauges over here, your volts, oil, and temp. Uh, you've got uh, your Knight Rider looking tack over the top, your uh, digital speedo. There you see just 32,000 miles on this thing. And then uh, Ford's uh, fancy digital trip computer with all the different shit you could get in at the time. Uh, pretty standard headlamps. Uh, I don't get the feeling this car was wildly optioned or anything. I think it's, uh, again, it almost feels like a rental to me of sorts. You've got manual headlamps. You've got no crews that I can see. And, uh, you know, the car just doesn't seem hugely well equipped. But obviously being uh, a Cougar, it came with some pretty good features standard. Uh, over here, you've got Ford's uh, in-dash uh, AM FM cassette. It looks a bit like a Sony unit the way the display and buttons are and uh, to my surprise this one still works $50 to spend on whatever your even the cassette needs. still works because I was running uh, my iPhone by using an adapter through that which worked out nice you got a couple of vents down here you got a climate control with weird buttons that I just don't remember you've got a little place to put guns there you've got cigarette lighter Nobody smoked in this one, so it's like Cougars in the 80s weren't the same. Man, look at that immaculate ashtray. Ridiculous. All of them had center consoles like this. You got a neat little place to store your narcotics here and maybe a switchblade here. Or I guess you could do pens and cigarettes depending on what you wanted. And uh, <clears throat> I imagine that light went away in later Cougars. And here's a nice little place for a small 9mm. Uh, it has this fascinating compartment up here on top of the dash. Uh, I'm not sure what went there in, uh, or if it's just that compartment. Maybe the XR7 had some kind of a, uh, who the hell knows what. But uh, anyway, that is a very nice place to put a pretty good amount of narcotics or a handgun. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be hidden from the state trooper, but it is a nice, tidy place to put it that's out of the way. Uh, in the glove box, you got a nice set of original books. Uh, Cougar 1989, a felty looking manual with the Cougar logo in it. Nice stuff. Uh, up here we have some unlit 80s cocaine mirrors also on the driver's side. So, yeah, and uh, very traditional and standard looking uh, center view mirror. So, uh, let's shift down here. This thing must have some kind of alarm in it. I don't think this came factory, that little red LED. Maybe. Who the hell knows? I mean, it just it looks aftermarket and I don't remember it from the time. Leather shift knob. It's all very nice. All right, so look, I'm not gonna make everyone suffer through the opening of the gates. I'm gonna pause it and we'll pick it up for a test drive at the end of the road. All right, so you got pretty smooth power out of that V6. I mean, it's certainly not uh, whip neck, breakneck speeds or anything, but it's nice smooth power. Um, I think the multi-port really helped it out. Also, the transmission shifts in an uh, imperceptible sort of modern way, and you've got the overdrive, which helps keep the revs down. Uh, the steering, they've definitely tightened up. I mean, the you know, going on that Thunderbird I did a few days ago, the steering was so over-assisted, you know, 70s feeling with the pinky stuff. Uh, maybe it's variable now by the time this car's come out uh, because, you know, it's much more responsive, uh, a little bit more effort that feels more you know, European, and uh, it's just sort of a nice, easy car to drive, I have to say. They make really good entry-level collectibles, this thing. I mean, they're old enough that people kind of notice them and remember 
the ones that they had in the past or the ones they knew and uh, they haven't seen them in years and it's kind of interesting but it's new enough that it's you know relatively safe it's got pretty modern engine and drivetrain parts that are easy to to get you can go to you know basically you can maintain this car at advanced auto parts I mean it's just not a problem uh, everything you need for it is there I mean you get into some of this old weird stuff and you have to have craftsmen make it on an English wheel you know a car like this uh, it's just a very effortless collector car to have uh, it has Goodyear Integra tires which I don't think they've made in a long time so I'm probably not going to be doing a highway run on it you know some people ask why the hell do you do a hundred in some of these old cars and stress them out like that well man I want to only have like the best old cars you know I'm really and and, and that car that old Buick for instance we did the other day the century that car should be able to run a hundred on the damn highway and it has 30 some thousand miles so it's not worn out and tired I mean I'm doing what the car was designed to do and uh, maybe even cleaning it out a little bit you know getting some of the carbon out of it so yeah whatever you know I think it has to be able to do that but I do um, I like the tires on this car they're in good shape they ride nice but I'm not convinced that they're not um, they're not too old to run high speeds on the interstate so uh, I'm gonna avoid that part and it's not gonna be on today what else? Um, so there it is. Look, the car drives nice. It really does. I mean, there's nothing entirely special about it. There's no rumble out of the pipes. There's no breakneck acceleration. It's it's just a nice cruiser. And, uh, you know, for a guy who wants to go to car shows and collector cars and, you know, not put out a ton of money and still have a bit of fun, something like this is a great option. Uh, you know, and there's, yeah, it's not just four. You got Thunderbirds, Cougars, Cutlasses, Grand Prix. There's all kinds of cars from this era uh, that you can do the same thing with and have fun with. Um, again, we got Thanksgiving coming up. We've got Turkey Trot coming up. So this is probably the last video I'm going to do before the break. Um, sorry about it. I'd like to do one tomorrow, but there's no damn way. If I don't do some maintenance on the spec car, I'm going to crash into a wall. And, well, that won't be different from any other time, but you know, this time it'll be the car's fault instead of mine. So, uh, so probably early next week. I still have tons of cars to go through. Tons of them. I mean, we barely scraped the surface. I've got mid-80s Rivieras. I've got a much earlier 70s Cougar. Uh, I got some really fun stuff coming up, and uh, I can't wait to do it and put it up. So, uh, thank you guys so much for looking, for subscribing, for clicking. I, I love reading the comments. Thank you for that. I know I don't always respond, but I promise you I look at them and read them, and I'm eternally amazed by some of the really cool dudes that are uh, that are watching these videos so thank you very much for all of that really appreciate it uh, if you have an interest in this car it is going to be for sale at Auto House of Naples on the web at autohousenaples.com uh, or by phone 239-263-8500 thank you so much for having a look really appreciate it and uh, we will see you with the next one take care